thanks everyone for joining us on this Tuesday. And uh, we're very excited to be in the part two of our, of our electric vehicle how-to series. Part two, preparing for infrastructure. So we're very excited to have um, a lineup today and I'm, uh, we'll uh, share that with you in just a moment. But um, next slide, please. Wonderful. I'm Tammy Bostic and I'm your moderator today. I'm the executive director for Utah Clean Cities and very um, honored to be part of the Clean Cities webinar series with the folks that are putting this together with you today. Thank you, Brian Trice, for bringing us all together. Next slide, please. All right, here's our agenda for today. Um, basically, we're doing the interjections and there's a Clean Cities overview. We wanna let you know that there are fantastic resources for electrifying your fleet and um, adding workplace charging and in general, just getting electrified. The speakers today are myself, uh, Tammy Bostic, and I'm going to share with you our workplace um, charging, uh, workplace electric study. And then we have Joanna Bell, who highlights the, cons and the considerations for public accessibility for charging networks. And then we have John Milliken, who explains the Regional Electric Infrastructure Initiative developments. And then uh, we'll follow up with a question and answer. Next slide, please. So general housekeeping, please chat with others in the chat box. You can select individual people or you can do a group chat. Also um, ask questions um, as we go along with the, the box. I mean, sometimes there's some really pertinent pieces that you have a question at that point. We're happy to address them. And Maddie, um, who has been so wonderful with, she's with uh, Columbia Willamette, she'll let me know if we need to address a question at that time. But in general, we, we'll do it at the end. Um, so be, feel free to log your questions. And then um, we also will be recording this and it'll be available to all attendees. Next slide, please. So again, today's speaker is myself, uh, Tammy Boss with Utah Clean Cities, Joanna Bell, who is um, with San Francisco Clean Cities, and John Milliken, who is with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Welcome, Joanna and John. Next slide, please. Clean Cities Overview. Next slide, please. I wanted to share with you a little bit, and any of you who are part of this uh, any of you who have been part of this uh, series have probably heard this before. I'm going to try to make it a little bit more electric centric, but the Clean Cities Coalition is a model of, uh, created by the Department of Energy. Uh, and we are, there are 95 of us across the nation and it's very exciting. Uh, you can see the blue states that have them. Uh, California has upwards of 13 and uh, some states do not and we share. So exact, for example, Wyoming helps out Montana and Utah helps out Nevada. So anyway, we have a great uh, network of folks that are there to help you, not only in your state, but regionally. Next slide, please. We all know that it's kind of everything on the table right now as we move away from fossil fuels. And so what we're asking for is some understanding that, and, and we'll experience that today, that there are no perfect fuels, but there are common sense solutions. So depending on where you live and your fleet and your demand um, and, your, and your duty cycle of what you use your fleet for, um, you have to make common sense solutions. And we know that people are in there um, looking at them today, but it has to be a return on investment and there has to be a total cost of ownership that works with your business model. So again, the Clean Cities Network works with this common sense solution, having upwards of 12 different fuels on the table for us to use today that are lessening our dependence on foreign oil and building a, a cleaner future for our transportation system. Next slide, please. One of the main things that the Clean Cities program is so proud of today is that we give you a choice at the pump. You're not stuck with one fuel, and if it doesn't work for your fleet or for your region, then you have other choices. So today we have biodiesel, electricity, ethanol, hydrogen, natural gas, and propane. And all of these are available in renewable form. So one of our biggest platforms right now is that you can use renewable fuels, and this is lessening our dependence on fossil fuels. So we're very excited about that. Another big piece that we're solving for today, especially with electric, is the alternative fuels corridor, which um, currently many of our alternative fuel corridors have this full variety of fuels that you see here. They have natural gas, they have liquefied um, propane or auto gas, they have uh, liquid natural gas, hydrogen, and electric. And so that's what we're talking about today, building out that infrastructure for electric to make sure that our corridors will allow you to drive your electric vehicles across our nation. Next slide, please. 
Wonderful. Another thing that I'll be talking about today, a little bit more in my slides, are the federal and state incentives that are available to you to help you convert your fleet to electrified transportation pieces. And we're going to talk about that in small steps, incremental steps such as workplace charging, which allows your employees and your vehicles to your workplace vehicles to plug in, but also a larger piece. How do you become part of that infrastructure, that corridor piece that it provides um, fast charging for these heavy duty, medium and heavy duty vehicles as they hit the road. So there are fantastic um, opportunities with your Clean Cities folks to look at laws and incentives, um, possible grants. We have a, a FOA that will be coming out at the end of the year, uh, the first of next year. So get ready and work with your Clean Cities folks and tell them the projects you have on your table, create uh, uh, some interest and some enthusiasm and be ready to apply for those, those upcoming funding opportunities. Next slide, please. And again, this is, we have some wonderful resources that you can explore yourself. We're happy to look at them with you and to support you on them. But this is the um, um, Office of Energy Development. Um, they have the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy site, and it's called the Alternative Fuel Data Center. That is an archival, wonderful portal of amazing information for you to make fantastic decisions, driving your fleet and making um, your policymakers, your legislators, your municipalities folks, those leaderships in your community, giving them a lot of information to support your, your fleet goals. And um, I'll share a little bit more about those with you today, those that are um, electric specific. So again, it's the afdc.energy.gov, and you can look at the stations that are available. And again, be that stakeholder that fills in those corridor pieces and helps out with our corridors across our state, across our nation. Next slide, please. So um, this is the second and a part of a series of three of just the specific electric vehicle how-to series. Part one was shown on August 4th, 4th, and that was preparing for your electric transition. And if you've missed that event, you can see uh, that you can actually pick that up and look at it um, as a recording. And you can also reach out to us and we can send you the slides. Part two, and that's today, is preparing for infrastructure. And uh, so you're gonna find out uh, the great information that we want to share with you today. Again, thank you for joining us. Us. Next slide, please. And the final in our electric series is preparing for the next level, and that will be on September 1st, and you can register for that on that link, and we'll also be sending out a formal invitation to you. Um, again, please reach out to us if you need any additional information or um, you want to give us some input on that. Thank you so much again for joining us today. And again, as our speakers come online, please put your questions into the chat box and we'll be happy to um, uh, tabulate those and discuss those at the end. So Joanna, myself and John will be online as well as Brian Trice and we'll be here to uh, help fill those questions and answer them as best we can. Thank you, next slide please. Um, I get the joy today of being the moderator and also a speaker, so that's fantastic. Welcome Tammy Bostic, and I'm coming to you from my cabin up in the High Uintas, so um, I don't have the cool background that my uh, fellow speakers do, but uh, you can see my cabin, so it's not as hot here as it is across the west of the western states, but um, it's hot, so uh, we're all enjoying a, a, a very uh, hot summer and I hope all of you are staying cool. So next slide, let's get into this. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking with you about a work electric program. And I wanna pull up my um, specific PowerPoint for myself just so I can look at my notes and make sure that I hit all of the points here. So let's pull it up. Very good. So work electric, one moment, please. Just gonna take one second for my computer to get this going. All right. One moment, please. Oh, very good, thank you for your patience. So what is Work Electric? So Work Electric was a program that we started uh, a couple years ago with a grant that we had through the Department of Energy and our large utility, Rocky Mountain Power. And we were looking at bringing infrastructure to the curb, so to speak, to the parking lot to make sure that as we built out this electric system that we know we need to, to have 
charging. And so that's a big piece of it. Before we can drive electric, we know we have to create range confidence. So this is a range conf confidence piece. The Work Electric program is a recognition and sustainability program to empower stakeholders like yourself to become sustainability leaders by adopting electric vehicles into your fleets along with workplace charging units for your employees. The Work Electric program provides the most advanced transportation plan supported by modern analytic tools like I just presented to you with the AFDC and all of those wonderful tools and problem solving tools that we have available for you to assure that you meet your short term goals and plan for the future. To have such an impact in our community is possible and this program was designed for both private businesses and the public public sector and those folks we know we have you have influence over our transportation habits and choices so again the transportation fleets that we are focusing on are schools and nonprofits data centers high tech businesses and um, we find that that's a really big piece and a lot of those folks that are working on computers they want to drive a car that's very much like a computer like a tesla uh, retail and hospitality multifamily housing units municipalities and governments and counties and uh, government agencies so next slide, please. Um, I feel like I have to kind of give a nod to Elon Musk. Um, he's an interesting character, but I think that he's been very brilliant in the Tesla because Americans, we love our cars and we want them to be fast. We want them to be good looking. There was just something about the early Leafs that didn't really appeal to most Americans, but the Tesla sure did. And he rocked the EV world for us. And so it's exciting to have that kind of uh, amazing leadership that, that put the Tesla on the road and it's American made, so we can be proud of that. So in order to have clean air in your cities, you have to go electric. And a little bit further on in my slides, I'll show you why it's so important for Utah and my coalition to go electric because we have some serious air quality issues. Looking at this model, um, this is something that you can kind of put into your brain, it's ACES. And ACES stands for Autonomous, Connected, Electric, and Shared. And that's the transportation system of the future. And um, when we look at this piece here, we can see that there's a lot of moving parts. There are autonomous vehicles, there's electric vehicles, people are sharing, they're riding on shuttles, they're riding on buses, but also they're living in a very clean city so they can walk. And that's a big piece for us. We wanna have uh, smart mobility in our cities. One of the biggest pieces that we looked at when we looked at this workplace charging program is that we were able to work with grants that were led, leveraged by our federal um, government through the Department of Energy and our local utilities. And then also, for example, in my state, we had legislative money that allowed for us to pull for a strategy transportation energy plan. And what we realized is that we couldn't pull infrastructure to the curb or to the parking lot without some infusion from our federal government and from state agencies. So we look at this as infrastructure banking. So anytime we see someone put a charging um, port into their uh, parking lot, they're building our infrastructure for electric charging. And then this is the smart mobility piece, the modern city. Uh, the modern city, uh, it refers to a model of transportation along or even instead of owning a gas powered vehicle. This can take on many different forms, including ride sharing, car sharing, public transportation, walking, biking, and many other options that we haven't thought about. I like to think about the hoverboards that people are ripping around on. So just in brief, I wanna go over this program. This is a program that we're piloting with an amazing leader who has shown uh, that he really has a vision for the future of electrified transportation. But it focuses on three um, platforms, leadership, to energize your workplace, to energize your fleet, and then to recognize your work as a sustainability leader. We like to focus on the benefits because we know no one really wants to do something unless there's a benefit from there. There are tremendous benefits from this and hopefully from this presentation you'll see what the benefits are. How do you build a work electric plan? How do you bring your influencers and work team together under a leadership platform? And so we want to look at this and uh, see that that is that piece. So next slide please. Oh, I realize I haven't been asking. I've been moving my slides ahead. Sorry, Maddie. Um, so let's go to the benefits. So if you can move ahead from ACES to the next slide. I apologize. I was moving my slides forward and forgetting to tell uh, Maddie to move hers. Infrastructure banking, we talked about that. The next slide. And the next slide. I apologize. It was all looking great on my screen. But anyway, here's the benefits. We're building a work electric plan and what that looks like. Um, and next slide. So pulling that together, we have a leadership piece. And we know that people charge primarily at work and at home. 
and if they're not able to charge at home, um, they're really going to be limited in the end. So without home charging, workplace charging becomes a driving factor in the EV adoption for passenger vehicles and zero emission transportation. Um, it's essential that, that we have workplace charging. Again, it allows people who are living in multi-family dwelling units to be able to charge an electric car if they can't do that at their home. Um, we also know that people are 20 times more likely to adopt an electric car if they do have workplace charging. So um, next slide, please. So um, I had mentioned the reason why um, air quality and zero emissions of the tailpipe is a huge issue for Utah. This is um, up Little Cottonwood Canyon. You come here to ski. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. But next slide, please. We also have a topography that, that um, you can see the high ochre mountains around us. We end up in this soup. I literally took my dropper, popped it in the middle of that, and that's the green color you see around the green air day, which is we call suffocating. And we get some really terrible inversions. In fact, we become one of the dirtiest cities in the nation um, during the winter time. So it's a tough problem for us to solve, but it's also a driving factor in why we want to become more and more increasingly zero at the tailpipes. So um, for Utah, over 45% of the transportation um, emissions create um, the pollution in our air. So we, we definitely look at transportation. Next slide, please. So this is a really fantastic piece. A couple of years ago, the Department of Energy came up with a program called um, uh, Work, uh, let's see, it was called um, the Workplace Charging Challenge. And this gentleman here, Hanko Kessner in Salt Lake City, took on the Workplace Charging Challenge. He was the only one in Utah who did it. There were about 300 corporations across the nation who said, yeah, I'll throw in some parking and you know, let's see what happens. Well, nothing really happened. And that wasn't okay for Hanko Kessner. So Hanko Kessner, um, he's an amazing, he's the founder of PackSize, which is a right size packaging. They, they actually create um, perfect packaging to cut down on packaging costs. It's an international company. He decided to make his home in Utah permanently and set up his corporation there. Um, he's, he looked at this program of workplace charging and it wasn't just really taking off. No one was adopting it. So he said, hey, I'll pay it forward. I'll buy you a charger for your company if you will then see the benefits of it and buy it for the next person. So it was a wonderful model and we were excited to, to be part of that. And that commitment started his leaders for clean air. The movement wasn't active enough for this charismatic and visionary leader, like I said. Um, he decided to do something about it and it caught the attention, not only of our local businesses, but of the whole world. This last year, um, Hanko Kessner uh, was a, one of the guest speakers at the United Nations uh, Climate, um, uh, the, the Climate Conference and uh, to talk about what he did in Utah. He has one of the largest living laboratories of electric vehicle charging systems in our state. And um, he's standing by one of them. He has solar going to them. He has fast chargers, he has slow chargers, he has fleet vehicles, and it's really just a fantastic model. So the program I'm showing you today is a program that he is piloting for us. And we're very happy to have Hanko on our board as well. So how do you energize your team? And this is what um, Hanko did. I mean, he jumped in there and said, you know, if you want to drive to work and you want to park in, uh, uh, thank you so much. If you want to park in a spot every day and have electric charging facing you and you don't plug in, you know, it's kind of, I could have had a V8 or I could have had an electric car. So you get free charging at work. What does that look like? So when you look at your, so we want to highlight the leadership. Obviously the administration's there with Hanko, his, um, his, his human services department's at the table, his building and facilities folks are there saying, how do we make this work? His employees are all in and many of them are driving electric cars. And of course, if you don't think that he hasn't branded his company and gained a lot of success around really taking that leadership role, I mean, just look at what the man's done with it. It's really pretty incredible. So when you enter, next slide, slide please. So you want to energize your culture. You want to bring attention to your parking lot because you've invested in it. So how do you engage, create culture, green your image, and then future proof? I mean, so that's the piece where we always say plan to expand. Lay your conduit. If you put one charging station in, great. In two years, you may put five more in, but plan to expand. Once you have that open, run your conduit, keep it going. Um, you want to make sure that you, again, plan to expand. The benefits. So we like to look at people like, well, this is not fair because people are getting charging and they're getting free, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, okay. 
join in. But if not, basic level one is 60 cents a day, level two is $1.50 a day. It's like a cup of coffee in the, in the room. You can also, if your employees kind of push back, say, hey, it's like a, a, a phone, it's like a gym pass, it's like a bus pass, you know? So those things are all easy to work through and we're happy to help you uh, with that language. Next slide, please. So again, this program is designed to recognize. And the reason why you want to recognize it is because you're really going to have real data and metrics to share. Again, highlighting your leadership. Next slide, please. People who say it cannot be done should get out of the way of those who are doing it. And I think that's kind of like what Hanko Kessner just said is like, we're going to do it. We're all in. I mean, now's the time. So next slide, please. So one of the things that we're doing right now is we're creating a dashboard to, to gather metrics. And we're using the Alternative Fuels Data Center. And we want to be able to say, wow, you have X amount of cars, you have X amount of fleet vehicles, you're saving this amount of emissions. Next slide, please. So this is how we're trying to recognize folks who have taken this initiative to join in. So we can compare their ICE vehicles that they gave up for their electric vehicles. We can show their average fuel cost and then the amount of CO2 that they're, they're, they're savings. This is a great piece, not only for your sustainability folks and for your your employees to join in with but as you add fleet vehicles this is a great piece to share with your stakeholders and your board members and your investors this is a great um, opportunity to say this is what we're doing and you can send it out to the community become you know a workplace charging uh, you know challenge uh, a champion and that's what we're working on today so next slide please so why would you work electric next slide It's a very simple plan and it's a great way to begin. Again, take advantage of those opportunities, those incentives to put a charger in your parking lot. A lot of those come from your utilities, they come from your state. vehicles to it. We know that the modeling, especially from the Department of Energy coming down, is that we want to electrify that 150 mile range, that 200 mile range with delivery vans, all the electric vehicles we can possibly put in there, we want zero emissions at our tailpipe in our urban areas. And then we look at, you know, a larger piece as looking at renewable fuels as you run the larger vehicles down the road. So what a great opportunity to brand your parking lot with a green fleet. Next slide, slide please. The reason why we're doing it, U.S. transportation by fuel type. So you can look at this and you can see who's using the fuel in the United States. This is the pie. Small and light duty vehicles are our passenger vehicles. Large light duty, those are our Ford F-150s, the most popular vehicle in the United States. And then look at trucking. Trucking, 23%. Next slide, please. So 50% of our fuel in the United States is used by fleets. So if we can solve that, if we can solve that as a clean cities organization, as, a, as stakeholders being, you know, running fleets, we're solving 50% of the emissions in the United States just by making uh, zero emissions at the tailpipe. And we can do it with a lot of alternative fuels, not just electric, but electric, you know, we're talking about that today. So it's a fantastic opportunity. Next slide, please. So again, I wanted to show you this as again, this, is, this comes from the Alternative Field Data Center. You can look there and you can look at sedans, trucks, SUVs, uh, refuse haulers, tractors, shuttle buses, school buses, they're all there. And you can look at them, you can compare them, you can see the vehicles that are tested and on the road. And again, this is in the FDA, AFDC site. Next slide, please. We also have this opportunity because you're going to get pushback and people go, well, you're basically driving a coal burning car and, you know, where's your emissions coming from? This is Utah's and yeah, we are driving coal, coal burning cars, but we have a z a zero emissions at the tailpipe and that's essential for us. You can much more readily control a power plant and the emissions and as our, as our grid system becomes cleaner, our electricity comes exponentially cleaner and so do our cars. But zero emissions at a tailpipe for a city like LA, Utah, San Francisco, Washington DC, all of these big metropolitan areas, we need zero emissions at the tailpipe, however we get them and electric vehicles are a great solution to that. There's a, a there's an EV Light Pro that can um, help you determine how many uh, electric charging stations you need in your state. Again, um, these are some tools that are on that side, the AFDC. Next slide, please. 
Also, that's um, you can click on that site, but you can go to fueleconomy.gov and you can find the, the this is an older uh, slide that I have, but there's a current one for 2021 and it has all of the, the cars you can find. Next slide. They have cars from 1984 to current on that site. So it's wonderful. You can look at the emissions of your 1984 Subaru versus your new Subaru. So it's not just about, you know, alternative fuel vehicles. All cars are there, but alternative fuel vehicles are there. So we're excited about that. So we look at these fleets. These are working fleets. Um, BYD has a lot of uh, fleet vehicles. Um, Orange EV, they have the yard tractors. UPS, they're a rolling laboratory. They have hydrogen, propane, uh, liquefied natural gas. Um, and they're running, this is an electric uh, vehicle. So we're excited to see that. Park City has electric buses and they have the most electric miles of any bus um, system in the United States. And we're proud of that. And uh, love to see them rolling down the road with zero emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we're waiting for, and this is again, that piece of building out your infrastructure, having it in your parking lot. These are all the trucks. We're all waiting for the trucks. At least I am. We all are. We're waiting for that four wheel drive truck that, that is better than what we have, better than the Ford F-150. Not any of the, you know, there, there are seven of these vehicles on the road. Um, they're not in full production yet, but I mean, we have to have that adoption piece. So of course the Rivian has caught our attention. The Nikola has the Badger, Bollinger Motors, um, Sorry, I'm just not really very excited about the, <laughs> the Tesla version, um, but uh, Lordstown came out with a good looking truck and, and Maddie brought up, she goes, how come they all kind of look the same? It's like, well, the, the consumer, this is the look we like. We like sort of the hybrid, you know, puffy up little Toyota looking truck, but, you know, we're excited to see this because as you recall, huge number, the most popular vehicle on the road in the United States is the Ford F-150. And we need to solve for that fleet vehicle. Once we have that, I think we're gonna rock and roll the fleet scene. Uh, next slide, please. And we're waiting for these. Cummins has their um, arrow on and then Nikola's coming on. And then we have the Tesla semis. We're looking at the full fleet of electrified vehicles. And again, we're trying to look at what that looks like along the corridors. How do we charge these vehicles? And I think we're all really aware of how stressed our grid system is of just trying to keep California cool with these rolling blackouts and electrification pieces. So this is something we're trying to solve for. There's no doubt about it, but we're looking at that. We have to have um, you know electric charging start charging and then we have to have storage and a grid system that can support it. So again, that's something that the Clean Cities program is looking to solve for and we need our stakeholders to work with us. Next slide, please. So how do you do this? You look at the, and again, this is, this is where your Clean Cities program comes in. We have a new FOA that will have $50 million on it, and um, that'll be next year. Reach out to us. Let us know what your fleet objectives are. Let's pilot something. Do something that's not there. Talk to us. We know what, what the, you know, the, the DOE program's looking for, and we're happy to um, help, uh, you know, brainstorm with you and your fleet and your, your local government, whatever it may be, um, and, and show that leadership piece. Show something that, that helps us visualize uh, and realize an electrified fleet transportation piece for the future. Next slide, please. Well, enough of me, and you've heard my voice too much this morning already. And we're so excited to bring Joanna Bell um, on. She's been an intern with San Francisco Clean Cities. Um, uh, Suzanne Lawson just speaks so highly of her. We're so excited to have Joanna here. She comes with um, a wonderful educational background and um, incredible experience. And we're delighted to have you here today, Joanna. So please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, next slide, please, Maddie. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, my capstone project. So I, in May, graduated from the Harvard Kennedy School with a master's degree in public policy. And along with a uh, colleague, Ashlyn Kong, we did our capstone project on planning for public EV charging infrastructure um, in San Francisco um, for the SFC Clean Cities Coalition. Um, so today I'm going to talk about San Francisco as a case study, but the lessons learned from um, our methodology doing our capstone project and how those can be applied to other cities and other contexts. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to go through an introduction of the San Francisco context, um, then go into the methods that we used, and then finally how we developed our framework. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. 
Um, so the challenge in San Francisco is that it is a transit first city. So their priority is to shift away from private vehicles, even electric vehicles. Um, so the kind of two governing goals that we were working under are um, shifting to 80% of trips uh, by a sustainable mode. Um, so that's walking, biking, or transit, and 25% of those remaining trips uh, taken by a private vehicle electrified. Um, so the issue here when it comes to planning for infrastructure is that you don't want to incentivize um, new car trips or try and prevent someone who could switch to a sustainable mode from switching to a sustainable mode because EVs, even though they're clean, um, zero emissions at the tailpipe, um, there's still a car that contributes to congestion. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so our research question was this, like how can the city of San Francisco best support the provision of EV charging infrastructure to promote wider adoption of EVs while still supporting San Francisco's transit first policy? Next slide, please. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna go into our methodology. A lot of the details of this, I'm gonna kind of zoom through quickly, um, but if you have any more in-depth questions, feel free to throw that in the Q&A box, or um, I'm more than happy to connect with anyone after the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so we took a three-pronged approach to our methodology. Um, the first was data analysis. So we were looking at residential um, supply and demand, public charging utilization, and then also demographics, um, mobility, housing trends, trying to get a real picture of like how people move and live in San Francisco. Second was qualitative research. So we wanted to make sure that our recommendations and our framework really fit into the research that is on the cutting edge of EV charging infrastructure planning. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that it fit in with the goals that San Francisco had already laid out and the planning documents that already existed within the city. Um, and then finally, because planning for EV charging infrastructure is inherently an exercise in uh, predicting the future, we tried to do a little bit of that um, with predicting how many trips will need to be electrified um, and pricing mechanisms that would incentivize adoption. Next slide, please. So um, this is part of our supply and demand analysis. We looked at EV registrations, so looking at where they're located in the city and not just um, by raw numbers, but as a percentage of total registered vehicles. So you can see that adoption is highest um, as a proportion of all vehicles around like the central corridor in San Francisco, um, but a little bit more spread out if you're looking at just the raw count of EVs. Next slide, please. And then this is the supply of public charging infrastructure. Um, so we distinguish between um, municipal public, municipally owned public charging and uh, privately supplied public charging. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, some severe charging deserts in, uh, in San Francisco with the vast majority of public charging concentrated in that Northeast section. Um, so yeah, that was kind of our vision of the supply and demand um, that's currently available. Next slide, please. Um, okay, then we moved on to a utilization analysis. So we only had session data available for um, the municipal chargers, obviously it's hard to get that for privately supplied um, or privately owned public charging. Um, and we were really asking three questions. So we were looking at utilization. So how often are chargers in use? Um, users, so who is using municipal chargers? And usage patterns. So how do drivers use municipal chargers? So that's looking at, are they plugging in in the morning? Are they plugging in in the evening? Is it throughout the day evenly spread? Are there spikes at any point? Um, and using that to get an idea of how these chargers are actually being used. Next slide, please. Um, and then we also looked at general travel trends, both within San Francisco and into San Francisco, um, because that would give us an idea of A, like trends. So where do we think, what do we think the city will look like in 2030? Um, but also what do we need to plan for? Where are most vehicles coming in from? Um, and how many, how is like the picture of private vehicle usage changing in San Francisco? Next slide, please. 
Um, and then over these next few slides, you'll see a lot of maps that kind of look very similar. We did a neighborhood level analysis of um, transit, housing, and demographic trends in San Francisco. So the idea here is we wanted to get an idea of um, how are people commuting, how are people using their cars. Um, so you can see here, for example, in these transit trends, we looked at the mode share of driving versus sustainable modes. You can see in the, like, the outer swath of the city, much, many more people are driving to get to work than the ones in the um, inner neighborhoods in the city. And next slide, please. Um, and then we also looked at housing trends. Um, we know that 80% of uh, EV charging happens at home. Um, but that kind of relies on having both off-street parking and the ability to install charging. Um, San Francisco is a very dense city, so that's uh, a real barrier to public charging infrastructure, um, or sorry, to home charging, and highlights the need for public charging infrastructure. So we looked here at um, the density of single-family homes, so those that probably are more likely to have off-street parking, um, and then rent or occupied homes. Um, so if you're a homeowner, it's easier to install charging than it is if you're a renter trying to convince your landlord to install charging. Um, and so you can see that this differs a lot by from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, um, we looked at demographics. Um, one of the challenges of EV deployment, as we all know, is that currently um, the upfront costs are still higher than ICE vehicles um, and there's not a super robust second-hand market. Um, but equity is a really important value for the city of San Francisco and for Ashland and I as we were doing our project. So we wanted to look at demographics across neighborhoods just to see if we're recommending, say, that um, charging be installed in Noe Valley, who's that actually serving? Um, so here we have, uh, race and income data, but we also looked at educational attainment. Um, yeah, like kind of every demographic uh, that you could think of just so that we had an idea of who we would be serving with our recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, then moving on to the qualitative research. Um, we use key studies from EV leaders uh, and key planning documents in San Francisco. So the ICCT was really, um, really, really helpful in kind of understanding what the cutting edge uh, research is telling us on EV infrastructure deployment. Um, and then we also used key planning documents within the city of San Francisco. So um, they released a EV roadmap last year. Um, obviously it's very important that our recommendations and our analysis fit in with the roadmap, um, but there are also broader planning documents about the city's um, uh, like sustainability goals. So one example is the Focus 2030 report. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that our analysis and recommendations fit in really tightly with everything that had already been done. Next slide, please. Um, we then spoke to uh, contacts in other EV capitals um, to see kind of what cities on the cutting edge of other uh, kind of various issue areas um, were doing and how they were approaching e public EV infrastructure deployment. Um, so we spoke to LA, Seattle, London, and Oslo um, and got really valuable information from them. Next slide, please. And then finally, we did some predictive analysis. So we were trying to answer the question, how many trips will be need to be electrified in 2030? Um, we chose this trip metric uh, because it fits in nicely with data that is already collected in the city of San Francisco. So they do a travel decision survey every two years now, I believe, um, where they talk to people um, both who take trips within San Francisco and drive into the city on the modes that they choose. Um, so uh, one of the key things that like this graph showed us was that even as, um, and obviously COVID has thrown a wrench in some of these uh, predictive analyses, but um, yeah, even as total trips increase, the share of private vehicle trips needs to decrease, um, which I think is a pretty stark finding. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so finally we were looking at how do we take all of this data that we gathered and use it to develop a framework. Um, next slide, please. So we first wanted to look at key user segments. Um, so looking at what vehicles are on the streets, who's driving them. Um, and so from all the data we collected, we kind of segmented it into these three main sections. So vehicles registered in San Francisco, daily TNC trips, so that's Uber, Lyft, um, those fun app-based rides, and then um, vehicles entering San Francisco daily. Um, so, yeah, next slide, please. And then one of the things that we noticed and that I'm sure you noticed looking at our maps here um, is that there are key differences between what we called inner and outer neighborhoods. Um, so inner neighborhoods tend to be denser, more multi-unit dwellings, but also wealthier, wider, higher educational attainment, um, later commute times. Whereas outer neighborhoods tend to have more single family homes. Um, so it's less dense, more off street parking, more opportunities for home charging, but also a lot of lower income families, a lot of people of color live in these outer neighborhoods. Um, so we saw that there was really kind of two charging strategies that were needed um, for these different user segments within San Francisco. Next slide, please. Um, so based on that, we segmented um, it into four groups and then developed a different strategy for each. So looking at outer neighborhoods, um, we recommended prioritizing home charging because of the prevalence of single family homes. Um, so obviously that's not publicly available charging, but because they have the capacity to charge at home, we felt that the city could um, work to incentivize that. In our neighborhoods, we felt required a uh, blended approach. And because we're really focusing on not incentivizing new trips and not making it easier per se for those inner neighborhoods to drive, we do want them to shift to sustainable modes. Um, putting fast charging in common destinations, so like the Whole Foods charging is a great example of that. Um, or at places where people spend a lot of time, such as um, shopping malls, not that there's a lot of those in the inner neighborhoods in San Francisco, but putting those um, in common destinations around San Francisco. Um, and then curbside charging as well, so people can charge where they live or shop or work. Um, visitors were another key segment. As you can see, there are more vehicles entering San Francisco daily than there are registered in San Francisco. Um, and one of the things that we noticed when we were analyzing the um, uh, the utilization data for municipal chargers was that um, primarily visitors were using it in uh, um, sorry, uh, primarily visitors were using it uh, rather than residents um, and that it was in very transit rich areas. So we saw that we don't really want to incentivize people to drive into the city, even if they're driving an EV. So we saw um, a regional approach is critical to electrifying um, these visitors while retaining, while like being responsive to San Francisco's transit first policy. Um, and then finally, um, we saw fleets as the a really important piece of uh, San Francisco's electrification strategy. So um, obviously there's tensions between city governments and TNCs and not wanting to kind of um, provide charging or pub use public money for private companies. Um, but electrifying a fleet vehicle um, has much more potential to uh, reduce greenhouse gas em emissions compared to electrifying a non-TNC vehicle. Um, so based on that, we also looked at um, drop-offs and pickups across San Francisco, and there are like key hot spots across the city. So we recommended installing charging and specifically fast charging um, in those areas, perhaps working with the TNCs to develop a cost-sharing mechanism. Next slide, please. Okay, and then finally, um, we wanted to look at quantifying the charging gap. Uh, so basically, how many more, like what should the ratio of EVs to charger, public chargers be? Um, 
And so one of the things that we looked at was having a different ratio in uh, inner neighborhoods versus outer neighborhoods. And using this less of a, like, we need exactly 4.2 chargers in Noe Valley, for example, um, and more of a, like, where is there the greatest need for public charging? Um, and so you can see we have some neighborhoods highlighted in orange here. And next slide. Um, and then in the outer neighborhoods, less highlighted in orange because there's, uh, because home charging is more feasible, there's um, not as great a demand for uh, public charging. Okay, next slide, please. And then finally, we wanted to fit into the framework, what is the role of uh, the city in providing that charging infrastructure compared to private companies? And um, so we saw that the city really had two primary uh, roles. And so the first is location. Um, so siting EV infrastructure. If you think back to that map that I showed at the beginning of um, public uh, charging infrastructure in San Francisco, you can see that there's a lot located in one area of the city, and pretty much nothing anywhere else. Um, so looking at what, who is not being served by the private sector and then and using the city to fill those gaps. Um, so obviously along the southern portion of the city, there are a lot of EV drivers, or sorry, a lot of drivers. Um, so the city can use infrastructure to help shift those drivers to EVs, even though a private company may not want to install in the Bayview, for example. And then finally, um, Pricing, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, pricing is the other um, key point of uh, the city. So basically, do you wanna use pricing to incentivize adoption, recoup expenses? Um, how attractive do you wanna make EV refueling compared to an ICE vehicle? Um, yeah, so that is everything. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box or contact me directly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Joanna. What a, a wonderful uh, a conceptual piece that uh, San Francisco has taken on to um, limit the, the number of, of and, the, and I love the piece of whether you're driving an electric vehicle or not, there's a congestion issue. And I think everyone needs to look at that. We can't build more roads and congestion is an issue. And that's part of, of the problem that we're trying to solve for. So good work and uh, fantastic to have you share uh, your uh, your capstone project with us. Thank you, Joanna. So, um, John, we have you up next. And so I don't ruin your last name. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Brian Tri sent me a, a note of how to pronounce your name properly. And I'm not sure if I'm doing that right. So, John, if you would let us all know how you say your last name. And, um, and then we're very happy to uh, have you with us today and sharing uh, your um, information. Um, so again, thank you, John, for joining us and uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Tammy. No problem on the last name. It's not a common one. It's been butchered more ways than I can remember. But thanks you guys <laughs> to Brian, Brian Trice and Suzanne Lucen for inviting me to join you all for the Clean Cities webinar today. I hope what I have to share for you is helpful. Again, I'm John Mikulin. I work for the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I'm stationed in our Region 9 office in the Air and Radiation Division. I'm a specialist in technology and partnerships where I focus um, exclusively on mobile source emission reduction strategies and technologies. And as part of that work, I, I serve as a member of our West Coast Collaborative Team, which is a program I'm going to talk to you about in, in depth here in a moment. Next slide, please, Maddie. So I'm going to pause here in the title slide just for a couple of background remarks and then dive into the specific subject matter that I was asked to talk to you all about today. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, our West Coast Collaborative Program has been in place since 2004. It is a public-private partnership focused on reducing diesel emissions from heavy-duty mobile sources and reducing, obviously, human exposure to diesel exhaust. Since 2004, EPA and our partners in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, Arizona, and the Pacific Islands and all the tribal lands they're in I've done a lot of work to mitigate emissions from heavy duty mobile sources, everything from exhaust retrofits to engine repowers to full vehicle replacements, in, including alternative fuel vehicle replacements in many cases. I'm certainly seeing growing interest in, in powertrains involving alternative fuels um, that would otherwise be combusting diesel. 
So that's kind of the, the broader framework that this project that I'm going to talk to you about exists under. And our West Coast Collaborative Partnership is a robust engagement of state and local agencies, the federal government, tribal agencies, the private sector, academia, and NGOs. And, and we really do have a, a long history of, of collaborating together to um, develop technology, deploy it into the field, and actually get it in the hands of fleets who, who can use it for, for cleaner and more sustainable operations. So with a little bit of the background, this project that I'm going to talk to you about today is about our Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Corridor Coalition, or AFIC for short, that's the acronym we use internally. Um, and it's really focused on medium and heavy duty alternative fuel infrastructure development along the West Coast. So with that background, Manny, please, next slide. So in 2015, Congress passed fix, the Fixing, Service, uh, Fixing America Service Transportation Act of 2015. And under Section 1413 of that statute, it directs the Secretary of Transportation to annually designate alternative fuel corridors for electric hydrogen fuel cell propane and natural gas fueling technologies for both passenger and commercial vehicles. Um, since this statute was ratified by Congress and, and signed by the President in 20, 2015, uh, EPA, Federal Highway Administration, and, and DOE, along with our state and local partners, have done a number of collaborative efforts to reflect implementation of this directive from Congress. And there's a variety of different success stories um, as a result of this uh, 2015 directive. And as many of you may know, the, the Service Transportation Act sunsets at the end of this fiscal year on September 30th. And it's anyone's guess as to, to what the next framework is going to look like and to whether or not federal highways will have capacity for grant making to support deployment of these alternative fuels. But that being said, there's certainly been a lot of work done to plan out corridors for these fuel types for passenger and commercial vehicles, and certainly a lot of really um, constructive collaboration with a variety of different parties from all sectors to try to figure out where this infrastructure currently exists, where there are gaps in accessibility to this infrastructure, and how we can activate markets um, through the placement infrastructure to, that will allow fleets to make that transition if and when they feel it's appropriate for their operations. So uh, next slide, please. So you can see here an example of some of the work that's been done on the West Coast to date for light duty uh, EV charging. And a, a lot of credit is due to our state transportation agencies in Washington, Oregon, and California for collaborating since the uh, Recovery Act in 2009 to really enable travel of light duty plug in electric vehicles along the West Coast using the I-5 corridor as the primary spine, but also including Highway 101. Um, and 99 through the Central Valley as well. So one of the things that combined with this success by our state DOTs that you see here, and also the directive from Congress under the FAST Act, we at EPA thought, hey, let's figure out if there's a new opportunity here to look at commercial infrastructure uh, like we've done for light duty ZEVs over the last few years, and look at this as, as a uh, potential for emission reductions, increasing fuel supply diversity for commercial fleet operations, a wider deployment of sustainable freight, public works, refuse collection, transit, school bus, and other heavy duty applications. And then as always, infrastructure is really hard to outsource. It by nature is a local economic development opportunity and job creator. So it also has that added benefit and all the different sustainability and public health uh, aspects and also energy, energy security aspects that I know for our partners at DOE are, are critical metric for performance. So. We thought that, that was a good opportunity and we figured out with our partners how to, how to tackle it. So in this next slide, you can see some of the goals and sorry about the title slide, the text that I submitted is in a different shade than I think the, the slide here, but I hope you can see that it says goals of the WCC APIC. So goals for the project. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to start by convening stakeholders around this issue and see if there was a, uh, a value added component for EPA to, to facilitate effort in the space. At every turn, that, that uh, hypothesis was affirmed by our partners. So we continue to conduct stakeholder work groups and targeted outreach to identify desired and unfunded medium and heavy duty alternative fuel stations. Um, we work to synthesize that input into a plan document. Um, and what makes those three components, I think, unique to our effort is really, it's not model based. It's really like many plans and, and infrastructure rollout strategies have, have been in the past. We really wanted to start at the end user level to figure out where 
they wanted infrastructure or where they need an infrastructure, and also for fuel infrastructure providers where they see a business case for project development and use that as a guidepost for where investments in the space would make sense for those that actually procure and operate equipment and then also those that serve those fleets through um, maintenance, operation, and construction of, of new infrastructure. And from that, also providing a platform for sharing medium and heavy duty all fuel infrastructure investment needs. And you'll see in some of the resources I'll highlight later on how we were able to do that for with some phase one analysis in partnership with CalSTAR. Um, and then using our plan documents as a basis for coordinated application for relevant funding assistance programs, which there are many through USDOT that state and local transportation agencies can access. Um, and then obtaining that, that assistance over time to implement some of the desired stations that were highlighted in our first order analysis in California, Oregon, and Washington for the fuels types that I highlighted a moment ago that were included in the, in the statute um, under the FAST Act. So next slide. So here you see our process roadmap that's kind of led us to where we are at the end of our, our first phase of this project. So we started in late 2016 to start to vet this and kind of do some market research, like I said, in terms of the EPA's value added um, effort in this space or whether we would be replicating effort or whether our help was not wanted. And pretty much at every level in the public sector and also in, in, in private sector development areas, it was highlighted that it would be useful for EPA to explore opportunities in the space along the West Coast and try to convene stakeholders to define where those opportunities would make sense for development in the near term and where there are needs in terms of investment to deploy some of those technologies. And in doing that, also wanting to uh, kind of true, true up the, uh, the data that we received on new stations and new investment opportunities with some project development criteria that help to gauge whether or not projects are actually ready to absorb new funding assistance and be implemented. And you can see in our plan documents when you have a chance to dig a little bit deeper some of the criteria that we use in terms of estimated throughput, proximity to other stations of a similar fuel type, um, access and, and proximity to major transportation corridors, the types of fleets that they would be servicing, the number of anchor fleets that would be involved in certain stations. So those are kind of some of the metrics that we use to really evaluate how ready some of the project proposals that we obtain would be. And then from doing, from doing all that data acquisition and analysis, we developed a strategic plan with our partners at CalSTAR. And they really did this as kind of an advisory analysis for the West Coast Collaborative to, to help address some of the goals that I highlighted earlier. And in March of this year, we were able to publish that phase one plan from CalSTAR and post it on our West Coast Collaborative website. So it's there as a public reference for anyone who's interested. And I'll give you some of the highlights here in a moment. But that's kind of how we got here. It's been a multi-year process, kind of working with a coalition of the willing to figure out where these investments are needed, um, where they would help fleet operations, um, where they would complement existing initiatives around fleet sustainability, emissions reductions, uh, fuel supply diversity, alternative fuel deployment, et cetera, all the things that clean cities tend to focus on. So uh, next slide. So here you see some of the highlights from our uh, phase one analysis with CalSTART. So we were able to identify 141 proposed stations across the, the western seaboard of the, the continental United States. Um, there were also some outliers in our initial data sample that were technologies that we weren't quite aiming for. Some folks who submitted data around things like Canary electric uh, technology for heavy duty tractors. Um, and then also there was one person in Oregon who actually submitted a liquid fuel uh, station proposal. But because of the, the parameters set by Congress under the FAST Act and our close partnership with Federal Highways, we really decided to stick to their criteria for the technological scope, technological scope of this planning exercise. And that's why we winnowed it down from the, the, the raw sample of 147 to 141, which is really uh, plug-in electric vehicle technology, hydrogen fueling technology, propane, compressed natural gas, and liquefied natural gas. And based on our, our rough kind of capital expense estimates involving those different technologies, and for a medium threshold, or a minimum threshold for a medium and heavy duty accessible station, we identify roughly about $374 million in needed investment to deploy all of the stations that we're able to, to um, identify under our phase one outreach and analysis. And one key finding here relevant for federal highways and USDOT funding programs is that 
77% of the proposals we received indicated that they would be ready to go for development with funding assistance um, equal to or less than 80%. And so that's really the cap for most of DOT's uh, funding programs is federal or is 80% federal cost share cap. So that's relevant in the sense that 77% of all the different state stations we were able to identify for medium and heavy duty all fuel operations, they would be feasible with um, kind of the standard issue block grant structure from US DOT or from a subsequent um, allocation from the state a DOT or a, a metropolitan planning organization. Next slide. Um, here you see a, a couple cross tables uh, that show you in more detail some of the data I just highlighted there. Um, and I'm gonna pause on this slide for a moment because there's a lot here um, and there's a, a lot of context that's happened since we published in March. So I'm just gonna pause here for a second and hopefully this will help as a visual aid as I, I work through some of the more de detailed elements of this. So you can see broken down here by fuel type and then also by state and fuel type, the number of stations that were submitted under our project with CalSTART. So you can see there on the first row for, for EVs, um, which I know is the emphasis of this webinar today, that 62 medium heavy duty stations were identified across the Western states. You know, we really were looking at, you know, this estimate here for average assumptions was really looking at like one to, or one to three couplers at each site for medium and heavy duty accessibility at around 350 kilowatts or less per charger. So um, I want to pause on that just to say that we are aware that the West Coast Clean Transit Corridor Project uh, or initiative, excuse me, Clean Transit uh, Corridor Initiative uh, by the West Coast Electric Utilities also has numbers around medium and heavy duty charging capabilities. And just as a, a comparison for something that we saw here as our kind of minimal baseline for accessibility for class five or larger truck or bus, they were looking at chargers around the same minimum at 350 kilowatts per charger, but they were looking at 10 couplers per site um, at an approximately $3.4 million per site instead of the 2 million you see here for that first line. So that's something that's helpful for context. If you're looking for a corridor based charging um, deployment for a larger scale accessibility for medium duty vehicles, so class five to seven, you'd be looking at like 3.4 million versus this 2 million you see here. Um, and then if you're looking at class eight tractors, you're looking at you know kind of two megawatts or so peak demand per charger. And again, with 10 couplers per sites, according to the WCC TCI analysis, you're looking at like $17.3 million per site for 10 couplers for class eight line haul tractors along a corridor. So that's a, a big variance there. I, wanna, I just wanna highlight that. So what we highlight here in our plan for the WCC APIC project for the West Coast Collaborative is really kind of the minimum threshold for class five accessibility. We weren't looking at kind of uh, step functions for fleet scale deployments and class eight tractor um, accessibility. So that's an important distinction there. And then also here you see when you're talking about electrification of powertrains, particularly in the heavy duty segment, hydrogen fuel cells we project will play a significant role in the, in the near term so for the next you know, kind of five to 10 model years, we definitely do foresee a number of products coming to the US that will involve hydrogen fuel cell technology. And kind of again, minimum threshold for, for station deployment in that space was kind of a thousand kilograms per day and looking at $6 million capital expense for that. Um, and then subsequently you can see for propane and for natural gas, some more mature alternative fuels in the, in the medium heavy duty sector you know, kind of some of the thresholds there. And I think we recognize, particularly those of you in clean cities that work with fleets, that, you know, if you want to go propane, if you want to go natural gas, if you have enough throughput, you can find station developers that are willing to kind of eat the capital expense and have that leased out through a fuel contract structure over time. Um, so I think that those business agreements, depending on the scale and the number of anchor fleets, may or may not actually require supplemental funding assistance for, for deployment. So I'll leave that for you to decide based on the actual fleet dynamics in, in your area. But those are some of the things that we certainly are aware of over the, the history of the 16 years in our program, dealing with alternative fuels in the heavy duty space. So I wanted to just pause there to talk about context and technology. Um, obviously there's a lot of different applications that could be served by stations like these. Um, but really looking mostly at, at on-highway applications and then for intermodal 
freight facilities where things like cargo handling, uh, harbor craft, and, and locomotives potentially could be served by these as well. So next slide. Some conclusions. Uh, there's demand for this technology. I think anyone in clean cities recognizes that there is demand. It's just about uh, making the use case and the total cost of ownership pencil for fleets to justify procurement. Um, we have a, a good raw sample of data that we've been able to help highlight the, those needs uh, for, for funding assistance and development to expand existing or uh, new and existing stations. Um, and then infrastructure deployment in many cases is already underway. And what we're talking about is getting that to a larger scale to make help fleets go to a full transition away from petroleum based powertrains to some of these cleaner emitting and zero emitting uh, powertrains that we highlighted earlier. Next slide. And I am looking at the clock and I think I got about five minutes left here. So I'm going to try to rip through these. Um, so for CalSTART's recommendations, again, this was a CalSTART consultant report uh, to the West Coast Collaborative. So they did provide some policy recommendations here. And I don't want to speak for them, but I will um, parrot some of the, the recommendations that they had in the document. Um, just taking the learnings to develop more specific state plans. And, and we're, we're currently working with the state DOTs and energy and environmental agencies on that layer right now. I think there's a lot of interest based on what we've been able to highlight from the states and, and carrying this forward to a, a new level. I think there's also uh, a commitment by most of our West Coast states to try to uh, streamline policies around alternative fuels. I think there's a lot of existing kind of gubernatorial policy commitments that will require policy alignment to support and ex to support accelerated deployment of these technologies. And I think you'll see a lot of that probably congeal over the next two or three years um, at, the state, at the state level. And then um, communication and, and outreach. I mean, we're through venues like this in clean cities, we're, we're hoping to share the information we found and also our intentions moving forward, which I'll talk about here in a moment, um, with you all and with partners that you work with. And then really help to highlight where funding assistance is available and really try to acquire some of those resources to deploy these technologies. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of funding coming out of DOT and, and our sister agencies um, at the federal level over the next couple of years. I think there may or may not, depending on how the economy rebounds from COVID, be state and local resources to do that. But I definitely feel that there's a doubling down on commitment to air quality and GHG mitigation policy across the Western region at the very least. And I think we'll see um, resources where available being allocated into this space for the foreseeable future. And in my mind, that's really between now and, and 2030. Uh, next slide. Uh, implementation, I mean, that's really the emphasis for us at EPA is, you know, there's a lot of great policy documents, there's a lot of great analysis, but really what matters to communities you know, what matters to human health is getting technology out into the ground and, and on the road that cleans the air. And that, that's really what we're all about. I mean, and all the steps I just talked to you about are a means to that end and trying to figure out how we can get the resources in the hands of fleets, in the hands of local agencies who can help to work with fleets and actually deploy these technologies is really the next critical step. And like I said, we're working with our state and local agency partners to see that that happens. I think there's a recognition, and I think many of you from the clean cities communities would, would recognize alternative fuel workforce development as, a, as another key need here. And I think there's an opportunity through grant making and administrative expenses to kind of build some of that capacity within fleets who are deploying these technologies. I know for us at EPA, we often do like when our partners include resources for uh, staff uh, skill building and expertise acquisition to help our programs be implemented more effectively and more efficiently. And certainly I would encourage you guys to think as you're looking for DOE and other resources on how to bake that into your, your technology focused uh, projects. And then also trying to figure out how to address environmental justice in a meaningful way while looking for synergies between community health needs and social equity with synergy for demand for that technology. And I think there's gonna be a lot of kind of uh, logical uh, partnerships in that respect, particularly around uh, goods movement hubs, major fleet depots. You know, a lot of the communities that surround those facilities are chronically impacted by air pollution. So there's an obvious need to deploy technology into those areas for purposes of fleet operation, but also to protect your neighbors from uh, the negative externalities of those operations. 
Um, sustained partnerships and in terms of our commitment to EPA, as I said, we've had a 16 year commitment to mitigating diesel emissions through collaboration. I don't see that changing anytime soon. We have a lot of support across the aisle in Congress um, for continuation of these efforts at EPA and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Certainly wanting to expand um, knowledge sharing for, for efforts like this to other regions in the United States to encourage replication. Um, I know that's a big part of what Clean Cities does as well in terms of sharing amongst the coalition. So I, I hope that you all can uh, share some of what we have here in terms of content for you with some of the other coalitions elsewhere in the country. Uh, next slide. So next steps, and I think this is my second to last slide. Um, we're distributing our plan. Feel free to visit our website. You can download all of our, uh, our materials there, including the plan document from CalSTAR from March. We've also finished some summary fact sheets in May of this year that synthesize some of the state specific findings from the plan document in a more digestible fashion. The plan document's almost 200 pages and we tried to distill um, the findings into five pages or less for each state. So hopefully those bite-sized pieces help you to um, interact with the material and comprehend it in, in a more readily accessible manner. That, that was our intention there. Um, we're currently in the process at EPA of developing a new web form to obtain new project proposals for, for, from APIC partners, and that'll be announced via our West Coast Collaborative Communicator newsletter. So please uh, visit our website and sign up for that if you aren't already a member. Our intention there is to re-canvas the three West Coast states that we've already worked with to obtain new data, and then also to expand to the other West Coast Collaborative geographies that um, like I said, the West Coast Collaborative encompasses EPA regions 9 and 10, so eight West Coast states, basically the, the entire U.S. west of the Rockies, and trying to figure out um, how many more stations are desired out there. Um, and then share the plan recommendations through stakeholder outreach. Again, events like this, but until we can reconvene in person um, after the COVID precautions are behind us, and hopefully we have a, a workable vaccine and, or herd immunity that allows us to convene the types of events that Brian and his team do at the GTSC. We're certainly hoping to meet with you all in May of next year, assuming it's safe to do so. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the APIC plan as it stands can be referenced by other stakeholders um, to support el participation in eligible funding opportunities. So that's it for me. That's my last substantive slide. My final slide is just a list of references and web links. Feel free to visit those um, at your convenience. Again, thanks for your time and attention. I hope what I had to share with you was helpful and, and look forward to continuing our work with all the Clean Cities coalitions around the country um, and our partners at DOE as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, incredible to uh, think about the future of transportation and what we are um, positioned to do and certainly um, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness of looking at the unique times that we're, that we're in and I can't help but be enthused about um, how we relaunch from a, a stopping point and certainly looking at how we can change um, our world to uh, better reflect a future that has cleaner transportation. Um, we've been working on it for, for many years. Many of us have been um, and part of coalitions that are 25 years old. So um, having that peace is important. See. All right. So, I, and one final point on that, um, I think this is, an, is essential to share. Um, John and Joanna will be um, sharing some of these uh, conversations. But um, as we look forward, and there is going to be a huge infusion, um, you know, starting in 2021 of funding projects. So, again, I encourage you to reach out to your Clean Cities folks and start talking about possible projects and funding sources, partnering your state dollars with your federal dollars, private, public. Those are so essential. And uh, there's a lot of great opportunity moving forward. So put on your thinking caps and start sharing your creative projects. So let's, uh, we're really happy to have uh, Michael Graham with Columbia Willamette's Clean Cities join us. He will be fielding some questions for us that have been generated during this webinar piece. And so uh, Michael, why don't you start us off with your first question? Awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks all of the speakers and presenters for uh, great, great content. That was terrific. Um, so quick question actually for you, Tammy. Um, while you're talking about the future of Tesla and Nikola trucks, Volvo and Daimler have trucks working with customers right now. Um, and those are, I guess, estimated to be coming out in the next uh, couple 
of months. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about some of that, of that information that you highlighted. You bet. Um, I think we've all been watching uh, vehicles come out. And um, a couple years ago, we were um, all involved with uh, the ACT Expo, and um, we're talking about electrified heavy-duty uh, transportation. And then further, we took a deeper dive with the uh, Green Transportation Expo put on by Brian Trice. And when you look at the OEMs and what are they, what are they saying? What, what's the possibility? So we look at Cummins, you know, we look at um, some of the bigger OEMs, what do they have online? And, and it's, it's coming, but it's not quite there. So do we stop you know, innovating? Do we stop early adoption? No, we don't. We need to still roll this forward. And we're all looking at this um, with some intensities and knowing that we need to move faster than we ever have before. So um, when I looked at making my slide with the, the, the passenger trucks, you know, the Ford F-150s, which there is a Ford F-150 electric coming out and slated to be 2021, they're not on the road yet. You know, so we know that anytime we have early adoption, there's going to be a few hiccups and things like that. But honestly, the electric versions have come out pretty smoothly. One of the biggest pieces we're trying to solve for is infrastructure. How do we get them moving um, in larger pieces? But I think everyone should be thinking as you start thinking about these new projects, think about the electrification pieces that can do 150 miles. Sure. What kind of duty cycles can make that happen? Am, am I answering that properly, Michael? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a good, a good insight. Um, thank you. Uh, so Joanna, a question for, for you. you. Moving forward, should cities look to create slash open EVSE departments to deploy, maintain, and operate infrastructure in a manner similar to their streets, traffic signals, and bicycle infrastructure? Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's a good question. Um, I think obviously it's city dependent too. Um, so what kind of resources does, do cities have available? Um, but I think one important point is that uh, San Francisco actually uses ChargePoint to operate and maintain their public charging infrastructure. Um, and public charging is something that kind of fits into a lot of departments. So in San Francisco, SF Environment has their hands in it, SFMTA and the uh, Public Utilities Commission as well. Um, so honestly, I think um, like my personal opinion based on the research I've done is that um, probably housing one single department um, or sorry one team in like a department probably wouldn't be super effective um, just because charging infrastructure has to work with so many different pieces of city government um, yeah that like having yeah like different teams work on it is probably the best answer um, I know right now there's a lot of conversation in San Francisco about uh, curb use. And so um, that's something where, you know, when we're thinking about potentially looking into curbside charging, um, you know, the curb team at SFMTA is really involved, but so is SF Environment. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And I mean, for, for any fleets that are looking to adopt some of what, what you highlighted, do you have any suggestions on how to take uh, your resources and use those? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the resources are more like geared towards like um, citywide strategy rather than a specific fleet. Um, but I think if you're like a charge point or a um, Electrify America or what have you looking at where to deploy, um, I think it gives a good idea of where demand is currently and where demand will be in the future. Um, you know, like if you look at those uh, neighborhoods that rely heavily on vehicles to get around, probably you're not going to... Uh, transition all of those people to um, uh, to sustainable modes of uh, transit. So planning for, say, like putting um, charging infrastructure in those outer neighborhoods now, um, or uh, like looking at neighborhoods with those really big charging gaps, like Noe Valley, um, Bernal Heights, the Mission, um, and working with the city to install charging infrastructure, I think can be helpful. Cool, yeah, thank you. Uh, hey, John, question for you. Um, 
for, what, are, what are some of your thoughts given uh, your work with uh, coordinating or assessing the, the alt fuel infrastructure landscape? What are some of your thoughts to help get a, to get public fueling sites off the ground? And also how can they use the resources that the West Coast Collaborative has put together to make projects happen in their area, looking from a fleet perspective? Yeah, I mean, in terms of partnership with the public sector to deploy these technologies, I feel like the best avenue for a fleet is to find a, a good champion within their local metropolitan planning organization, because these are the group, these are the agencies that really determine how transportation funding is implemented in the regions of the United States. There's a lot of delegation that happens from the federal state to the regional level for transportation planning and resource allocation. And if you as a local fleet don't know who your MPO is or who works there in your technology space, you're really fighting this battle with one hand behind your back because you may be able to get some funding for vehicles out of EPA, you may be able to get money and fits and starts from DOE, but the real money is at DOT. I mean, they their budget for purposes of capital infrastructure deployment uh, dwarfs anything that DOE and EPA will have combined on an annual basis. So that's a really good kind of first place to start and then also, you know, whoever on behalf of your city or your county engages at the MPO kind of governing board level, make him or, him or he or she aware of what you're trying to do and make it a local priority to get it done. Um, without that kind of ownership and collaboration, it's just really hard from a fleet budgeting perspective to make a whole scale transition from what you've been doing with diesel or gasoline for the last X number of years, a full switch to whether it be battery electric, plug-in hybrid, hydrogen fuel cell, propane, that gas, what have you. If it's a totally different fueling technology, it takes an entire ecosystem to make that really work within your fleet operations. And then you need that kind of threshold condition of having infrastructure accessibility, whether it be behind the fence or something that's uh, kind of limited access by a number of, of commercial fleets in your area. Okay, very cool. Uh, another question for you, John. Um, what, what's the status of coalitions putting together funding for stations? How would a fuel provider get involved moving these forward? Yeah, so EPA's role in this process is really advisory. We don't have the authority to fund infrastructure for EPA. We do have the ability to fund vehicle repower and replacement. Um, and in some cases, uh, fleet expansion and deployment in certain parts of the country under certain funding programs, um, but we don't have the ability to do this. Really our purpose is in initiating this project was to address what we see as a chronic constraint to the efficacy of our fleet oriented incentives. Infrastructure is a major constraint to scale. We can fund you four to $5 million to do vehicle change outs, but if you don't have commensurate infrastructure to make a transition beyond that, you're kind of stuck at that position and you're not able to make that change beyond. And so that's really our role is to acquire data and put it in the hands of people who can act upon it. And, and like I said, in the public sphere, the entities that can act upon this type of information are state departments of transportation and the regional metropolitan planning organizations, and obviously in collaboration with the state energy and environmental agencies as well. So on the West Coast, you know, you're in Washington, that's Washington State DOT, that's Puget Sound Regional Council at the regional level in, in the Seattle area, that's Washington State Energy Office in the Department of Commerce, and that's the Washington Department of Ecology. And then work your way down the coast and all of those kind of counterparts need to be working together to make sure that the resources flow according to the opportunities that EPA has been able to, to highlight in our partnership work um, in terms of new station investment opportunities. And again, we'll be continuing to acquire that data and sharing it with the states. And hopefully they'll be following up with developers to actually make those projects a reality. Right on. Uh, I guess a follow-up to, uh, follow to that one is how can a state DOT connect with project proposers identified in the study? Yeah, so state DOTs are, as we acquire the data, we are sharing the information on the, uh, the substantive technical data that's been submitted, but also who has been submitting it. Um, so that state and local agencies can actually follow that lead for, for project development on their own. Again, because for us to follow through on it is somewhat of a dead end proposition because we don't have the resources to implement. 
it really is best for the state and locals to, to be the ones to follow through with a private developer or with a fleet manager who is wanting to, to get something for their own operation. Okay. Uh, Tammy, question for you. Um, who should folks contact to get started with Workplace Electric? Um, they should contact Utah Clean Cities. And we're very happy to uh, get folks set up. We actually have about 12 Clean Cities coalitions that are just getting ready to launch that project with a couple other pro We have a corridor project where we have a regional um, Clean Cities presence with an uh, eight-state um, collaborative. And then um, all the folks that are involved with this webinar series are in the process of getting a work electric program set up. So that'll be very neat. It's uh, all, it'll be customized to have the resources for your states, the resources that are available, um, again, uh, federally and with your state and different grant programs that may be available that folks might not know about. So please reach out to Utah Clean Cities and we'll get you connected to the right uh, sources for um, that kind of a program. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. We have a new uh, message that um, came through. It says, where should the public um, heavy duty truck schools program um, look like for funding? Where should they look for funding regarding charging infrastructure, et cetera? So I think this is a great question um, about, you know, how do we prepare the workforce of the future to um, learn about these charging infrastructures and alternative fuel technologies. That is something that is on all of our minds and um, really lucky that we have the Columbia Willamette folks here and also um, the Long, Be Long Beach um, with, under the um, guidance of Janet Malik because um, they do so much excellent training. It's essential that we have training for the, the fleets of the future. For um, It came up in this series, for every one truck that's on the road, there are 10 service providers keeping that truck on the road. So we know that it's essential that we have a workforce trained in the future. And we're looking at that. We wrote a grant, we've been working on some projects to make sure that we do have um, those um, tech schools going, those, um, those vocational schools going, and um, it's essential. It's essential that we have that pairing, this new infusion of money and resources going into this transportation uh, uh, programs, you know, Move America Forward program. It's gonna be a lot of money. We need to have the workforce in place, and uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we look really forward to seeing how this all comes together. So we need to keep those wheels on the road and those mechanics going, those engineers going, and uh, that's a big push on all of our parts. Yeah, Tammy, so I would see just add to the, to the question or uh, the commenter there that um, certainly a lot of electric utilities are supporting charging infrastructure deployment around the country. So whoever's uh, electric service area you're in, that entity actually may be providing direct infrastructure support at some level, whether it just be the, for the charging pedestal, whether it be make readies for the conduit up to the charging pedestal, depending on where you are in the country, there, there's a lot of resources in that space to promote um, EVSE deployment, particularly for medium and heavy duty fleets like school buses. And where there's a bi-directional charging component for vehicle to grid services, you know, a lot of folks realize that for, for school buses, it's a really good use case um, for grid services and bi-directional charging. Right, and I think there's there's incredible opportunity for folks to be looking at it, especially as they look at funding and projects. Um, what's our resiliency piece? How do you have a diversified fuel piece? How do you use your school buses that you're going to invest in that are quite expensive? Um, how do you incentivize those so the incremental cost is covered? But also, how do you look at them as a generator? You can take the, you know, those buses have big generators. What do you do with the afterlife of those batteries? Can they be stationary uh, battery storage? Uh, the bus I showed you with Park City, they're taking, they're leasing those batteries and they're buying those batteries back from Proterra and they're using them as um, a generator. So there's some really creative pieces we can move forward. But again, I think that, that uh, first piece of how do we tie this together with a whole new workforce? This is a fantastic opportunity for us to do that. We have a question that um, I'm going to uh, pivot off of that. We have a question for Joanna because I think this is really interesting. How does your um, MA in public policy inform the roadmap for electrification? Tammy, um, I think kind of in two key ways. Um, so first is the role of data in planning. Um, like I'm sure you saw that we did a massive amount of data gathering and planning and got a lot of key insights that uh, really wouldn't have been available without being able to kind of dig into that data, um, you know, ranging from 
that um, you know visitors are the primary users of municipal charging infrastructure. Like that was a really interesting finding, um, and is really helpful for planning going forward. Um, and the second is looking at the role of government in uh, planning for EBSE. Like I think the question about the uh, creating a department for planning within the city government is really interesting. Um, yeah, because you know there are some things that cities do really well and some things that they do not so well. Um, so looking for how the city can kind of advance equity goals, um, especially for something like a new technology where the early adopters are going to be, you know, people who are wealthier, able to take more risks with technology, um, and kind of looking at how the city can uh, facilitate yeah that equitable deployment i think is um really key um yeah and that's something that obviously we talked a lot about in my public policy degree awesome and i think what's so exciting now is um that these transportation plans are coming out and they're so different than what they used to be you know we built a lot of roads before so how do we build less roads and have better transportation and better flow and those are fantastic i mean looking at um the the lights and and how things converge and, and different time of use days i mean these are exciting pieces and again um, the clean cities program is very focused on fleets and it goes from light duty to heavy duty so how do we solve for it with those pieces and what does that look like to have zero emission um, electrified transportation on a larger level and how can we be smarter you know how can we be smart about how we move goods and services so it's exciting to see the work and uh, and what you'll be doing in the future Joanna you're in a, a fantastic position and we're very excited to uh, see where your career leads you um, so we're going to swing back and, and uh, Matt if you would mind um, bringing up uh, the slide for next week. Um, let's just remind everyone before we start uh, having people peel off. So again, this is a uh, part two of a three-part series. Um, this is our how-to series. So how do you electrify? And I think one of the biggest takeaways is that we want to build range confidence and we certainly want to build our infrastructure. And what does that look like? Um, building out the new infrastructure of a very aging um, infrastructure system and the Move America Forward um, initiative is certainly to do that. And we're looking at a new deal that will be beyond the new deal that we've ever had. So it's building a workforce. It's building the transportation systems of tomorrow, those energy systems of tomorrow. Um, what does that look like and how can we be resilient in the face of, of tremendous challenges with our climate and with our resources? So we're very excited to uh, be part of that and we hope that you join in with us. So part three, preparing for the next level. Um, that's on September 1st. It's at the same time and you can register at the link that is shown here. And again, look for send outs from your Clean Cities folks and uh, we hope you will join, in us, join us again do we have any more questions for the day? Um, this is your last chance. So uh, we thank you. If you have any questions, again, please contact uh, anyone that you see here or any of Clean Cities that you have uh, a connection with. But uh, you can see that there are six of us here that are very anxious to begin working with you. All six of these uh, programs will have a work electric piece um, uh, forward coming, whether it's in the next within this year or next year, but they'll be happening. In the meantime, Utah Clean Cities is very happy to help you. Um, we're all in this together and we look forward to working with um, you folks that are, are on the cutting edge of technology and innovation. So again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time on September 1st. Big thank you to Maddie's with Willamette Clean Cities. She's awesome, we appreciate her. Big thank you to Joanna, thank you John, thank you Brian Trice, thank you Michael. Uh, we want to also thank Janet and Suzanne and Angela and Richard Battersby. Take care and stay cool.